All right, we're looking at a video from the mainstream today, the Wall Street Journal, specifically a couple videos that Joanna Stern put out about EV charging and her experience attempting it in Los Angeles and then New Jersey. Let's dive in because I have sort of a history with the mainstream media here. Here we are, Beverly Hills. Bad traffic, so many electric vehicle chargers. Charger number one, two, three. From the streets of downtown to the beach in Santa Monica, 11, 19, 23. We visited 30 DC fast charging locations. None of them run by Tesla. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. None of them run by Tesla. That's a problem when you do this test, not just because the Tesla network is better, it definitely is. It's more that you are picking a niche use case. This is not the most common experience people are having, especially in Los Angeles. And I've seen this done before where the New York Times actually took a Chevy Bolt from LA to Las Vegas and had a really difficult time trying to charge and all that. Whereas I went and did it in a Tesla, even back then it was the exact same thing where they were the vast majority of cars on the road and I didn't even have to stop if I didn't want to. The mainstream media likes to do this. They like to take the kind of the worst case scenario and then present it as this is a generalization for everyone else. And I can see that's already where she's headed from the very beginning by choosing the worst case scenario here, not using the Tesla supercharger network, which is by far the most common experience in LA and the United States. That meant more than 100 different charging stalls. There was just one little problem. Yeah, this one's broken. Broken and also broken. Okay many problems. Come on, you can do it. Connect to the vehicle, error detected. At just over 40% of the charging locations, I encountered problems. Not good. Agreed, not good and also is not common. This isn't the most common experience that people have. That 40% number is quite a bit higher than what other studies have found where you're looking at about 72.5% uptime from non-Tesla chargers. So certainly an anomaly, but you know, not an extreme example, not like beyond two standard deviations or anything like that. However, again, if we look at the most common example using the Tesla supercharger network, we find that their latest example, their latest data shows that their uptime is 99.97%. Basically flawless, basically never down. And if they are, it's most likely something to do with construction happening in that moment. And this is a great thing because what that means is that as Tesla opens up their network to more and more folks, they are gonna improve that experience overall. But I agree, I'm not trying to say she's lying about this. Her experience is a little bit abnormal, but kind of common for non-Teslas. However, with Tesla opening up their network, this is gonna become less and less of an issue and probably force these other networks to really step up their game and improve that reliability. Plus, like the majority of non-Tesla EVs, it has a CCS charging port. When you've got that port and you need to charge, a DC fast charging station, typically an EVgo or Electrify America, is your best bet. Or the Tesla supercharger network, which now actually is supporting of Rivian and her exact example here. And in fact, nine months ago when she uh, did this video, there was already reports that Rivian owners were going to have access to it. So it's one of those things where I think she's being a little bit disingenuous here. Later in the video, she does try to correct this, but at this point, she's really framing it as this is the common experience for everyone, and it's just really not the case. Nearly 10% of the stalls visited had payment issues. It says cash only. Where would I put cash? Yes, there were specifically repeated credit card problems. Why are you beeping at me? Present card again. This is unfortunately one of the challenges with these non-Tesla chargers in the United States is that they have to support the credit card type payment and that creates problems. As you can see here, the actual payment readers are made by someone else typically, and then they have to have a good cellular connection. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Whereas with Tesla's and actually EVgo, I believe, and maybe Electrify America soon, they support what's called plug and charge, where that all happens later or kind of upstream in the cloud. So the car identifies itself to the charging, and then the charger connects with the cloud and says, oh, does this car have a payment method and all that set up? In which case, just go. I don't have to worry about it right now. So that is the experience that is coming online, but it is not fully adopted yet. And so down the road, this will all go away in the United States. You'll have to just set up your card with your app, whoever it is, with Ford, Ford Pass, Rivian with theirs, Tesla, et cetera. And then from there, the charging networks will just look to the 
manufacturer if they support plug and charge and if so go ahead and charge you so hopefully this will go away and right now i agree it is just not a great solution out there and it is very spotty in how it works but 10 percent sounds quite better than what i've experienced personally charger meet rivian rivian meet charger connect error detected this may be the most frustrating one of all when the car and the charger don't connect to each other, what many call the handshake issue. Basically, when you plug the charger into the car, the two have to talk to each other and send information about voltage and energy levels back and forth. And a lot can go wrong in this process. This does seem to happen more with the CCS adapter versus the NAX port, the North American charging standard from Tesla. And I don't know if it's a factor of Tesla just being vertically integrated and better at doing this, or if the charging standard itself is better. I'm not quite sure of the mechanics of that, but this handshake is an issue. And so often you have to just unplug and then replug. But a better way is to not have to deal with the payment stuff, either through the plug and charge technology or by using an app-based payment. So essentially with EVgo and Electrify America and all those, and actually Tesla even, you can use the app, open it up when you get there, find the stall you're at, say I'm about to begin and charging and then plug in and all that other separate connection problem the the challenge of finding the payment and all that is already taken care of so if there's no timeout because that's typically what happens is it just takes so long for the first part of the process to go through that by then the vehicles sort of become uninterested and not going to respond to whatever the charging station actually wants to ask and make sure that the connection's solid and those kind of things so yes this does happen uh, but again as we switch away from the ccs port to the NAX port this should solve itself or hopefully become better and of course with tesla superchargers it's uh, it's a far better scenario where it's rare that this ever doesn't work this handshake issue isn't just a rivian thing i've experienced this problem on many different evs many different evs but not a Tesla. Let's put this into perspective, just how more common it is to be driving a Tesla in California than it is a uh, Rivian or anyone else. So I made a chart as I like to do, and I pulled the data from the California Energy Commission with a link to it down there in the bottom. And you can see the number of registrations, it's a running total of registrations of battery electric vehicles, so not plug-ins, by brand since 2010. And you can see one of them stands far and above the rest. And in fact, the California Energy Commission posts a similar dashboard that we can use to actually just further dive into how big of an advantage or how much more common a Tesla is versus someone else. So here on their website, we have the new ZEV sales, this is zero emission vehicles sales in California, and they have this dashboard here. So this is as of Q2 2024, you can see kind of that's what this main section is here. It's showing you the current registrations, LA County with the majority of them. Um, but if we actually go overall, you can see sales through 2024 Q2, 1.9 million. If I hover over that, you can actually see how that's been going. And here's battery electric. This is a really great dashboard. They've done a great job. Now, look at that so we have 1.4 million battery electric vehicles that have been registered in california so far and if we actually take that out and just look at tesla 920,000 of them are Teslas. 920,000 of 1.5 million, we'll call it. So that's just over 60% of electric vehicles in California are Teslas. By far the most common example out there. And so that's why I really just get frustrated by this because you look at it and you go, you guys aren't telling the truth. You're not telling the whole story here. You're telling this one slice of it. And in fact, that slice is actually getting bigger and bigger because now Ford and Rivian can use the Tesla supercharger network. The DC fast chargers I tested have to communicate with lots of different types of electric vehicles, which is why things can get so much more complicated than on Tesla's network. So it's one station trying to figure out how to communicate with multiple different types of firmware. Whereas if you have a Tesla system, it's a vertically integrated where they have a car, a station and a payment system that's all together. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Vertically integrated systems technology definitely tend to have less issues. Think about iPhone versus Android. I'm a huge fan of Android, but definitely with the myriad of options out there on Android phones, not all updates work exactly the same. Tesla is essentially the same when it comes to vertically integrated, the hardware and the software, making for just a beautiful, seamless experience. And now with other companies coming on board, essentially the challenge is, is that they have to make sure that that experience doesn't change. And I can say from personal experience that so far it's as good charging a Rivian on a Tesla supercharger network as it is charging a Tesla on that same network. And thankfully, there is some development on this. There is a new ISO standard for that handshake for 
plug and charge it's called so that way almost all vehicles in the future will just be able to plug into any charging network and just automatically work here in the United States so hopefully this is going away there's a lot of progress to still to be made but there is a standard there which hopefully will make it much easier imagine like if uh, you have a different web browser and there was a not a standard for how web pages were displayed it would just not work right but thankfully we have HTTP and we have uh, FTP and all these other protocols that help us transfer data on the internet. So regardless of the kind of sender and receiver, things just work. There's more to it than that, of course, but that's kind of what we're working towards here in the electric vehicle space are protocols and standards. That way it doesn't matter if you have a Tesla, a Ford, a Chevy, whatever the case is, they're all gonna communicate on that same standard and life will hopefully be a lot better. Starting in 2024, Tesla's opening up its charging network, allowing cars from Rivian, Ford, and GM, and others to charge at Tesla stations. Doesn't fit, at least not yet. Eventually, those car companies will also adopt Tesla's NACS charging port. Will it be total hassle-free charging? Well, let's find out because you actually did a video updating this after that adapter came out, charging your own Mach-E, I think it's your own, in New Jersey. So what did we learn from all of this charging today? We learned that this dongle is a pretty good deal. There you go. You said it. Absolutely agree. And in fact, there's third party ones. And I've heard people have concerns about those. I have a third party one as a backup, but I also believe that it will work fine. So absolutely, your having that dongle is a big game changer for people or companies that have uh, the support of it. Right now, it's just Ford and Rivian, others obviously coming soon. Um, but also, Tesla is ramping up production of them. So if you're unfamiliar why maybe you're a Rivian owner and you're still waiting on yours, it's because Tesla makes them. So the, the adapter that she's holding there that is for Ford, is the exact same adapter for Rivian and everyone else. And so Tesla makes them to certify them. And so they're just ramping up production recently. And so they're going to be coming out to many more people. Down the road, it'll basically be just kind of ubiquitous. So they'll all just work on the North American Charging Standard or NACS, and we won't have any of these issues. And to be fair, in her update video, she did point out the current challenges with the supercharger network access. And that is that you have to usually take up two spaces. It's more expensive and it may not charge as fast and we have some actual data and videos to show you here from a recent road trip I took using the supercharger network in my own Rivian R1T and here is just an empty parking space next to it so I chose that one so this space is not taking up anything I'm only taking up space of one charger instead of multiple so as you see there in my example, there are a lot of cases where you can park your non-Tesla, which has the charging port typically on the, the wrong side, meaning you would have to take two spaces. But there are a lot of cases where you can just park on the end or maybe from a different angle and you don't have to do that. So anytime you are charging a non-Tesla at a supercharger, make sure that you look for that one um, to try to avoid any problems or any disruptions. And as you can see here, yes, it is fast. We're looking at 200 kilowatts of energy coming in, which is really, really high. That's almost as high as the Rivian can take. And so whether or not you have a Tesla or not, you're gonna get fast charging. And then there's cost and Tesla does offer a way for you to have a subscription. It's around $12 a month and it'll knock off between 20 to 30% of the charging costs, essentially bringing down whatever the kind of surge pricing is or non-Tesla pricing is down to the regular pricing that a Tesla owner pays. So if you use them a lot, I typically don't. So it's not worth it for me. But if you do, maybe it's worth it for you. You'll have to do some math on that. At an EVgo station in Santa Monica, I got to try out some newer charging stalls. It says checking cable safety, matching voltage. This tells you what it's doing. These new machines are great. Agreed. Uh, the newer ones from EVgo and Electrify America are actually very good. Uh, the older ones, the original ones they came out with, have a lot of challenges, as she mostly encountered here in this video. But basically, that just means that the rest of the EV charging infrastructure or charging companies out there have a long way to go to catch up to Tesla. And I don't know if it's going to be really a big incentive for them because Tesla is already such a dominant player. And once they start opening up access, it's just going to fuel their ability to add more and more chargers. For example, she's here in Santa Monica at EVgo. I went to a Santa Monica charge just recently for a Tesla supercharger one and it had 62 stations 62 like a tremendous amount it also had its own cafe just for Tesla owners and non Tesla owners as well that you could go in there was like little sandwiches and stuff you could get a bathroom that was nice and clean and kind of secured and all that so yes uh, they are good. There's going to be a lot of competition here, and hopefully it means that these other non-Tesla networks are going to really have to step up their game. Otherwise, they may go by the wayside, unfortunately. 
the future is bright. Uh, electric cars have some challenges, but those challenges are mostly solved. And where they're not solved, there's a huge investment and there's a lot of changes that are coming that are just going to make it sort of ubiquitous. And that's better for us all. Not because of any other climate change reason or something that somebody may not believe in, but just because electric cars are just better in so many ways, including probably the biggest one is that they reduce air pollution. Local air pollution where electric cars are is far lower. And that right there means less issues with air pollution related illnesses, which outnumber car accidents at least two to one in many areas, meaning that we're going to have less premature deaths, which means more economic output. And economic output increases the economy. It just makes life better for all of us here. And I think that's hopefully something we can all get behind, as well as what I'm doing here is bringing data and facts to the conversation, something that I don't see enough of out there. Because remember, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And we don't need more of that on the internet. Certainly not. Hopefully we can all agree on that. That's it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. Also, if you want to be one of the FUD fighters and help me find these videos, check out a link in the description where you can actually submit a video you found and we'll consider it and maybe give you a little something special there if we pick the video that you sent in. So that's it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you back here next time.